are Loyalist Petarabo and the Imperial Iron Warriors. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a stretch, you say? I agree! My original estimation of Petarabo hasn't changed much since I did the full lore video on the 4th Legion Primarch a little over a year ago now. And incidentally, if you're not one of the 400,000 plus people who have already watched that video, I highly recommend you go and listen to that first, as there is a lot of context in that video that we will be relying upon somewhat today. But where to begin? Petarabo's first official act as Primarch of the 4th Legion Astartes was to have a tenth of his legion beaten to death by their brothers, because they hadn't performed up to his standards in a previous engagement. Petarabo had virtually every planet the 4th conquered stripped of all life leaving behind garrison troops to welcome fresh Imperial settlers to take up residence in the graveyards of the previous ones. Petarabo the Primarch, who seemingly would rather see his own legion annihilated at the warping influence of the Hrud than retreat and admit defeat. The Primarch that preferred to be guarded by automatons rather than his own warriors whom he did not like or even trusted. Not traditional loyalist material, I admit, but I managed to come up with a reasonable scenario to turn Conrad Kurz into a loyalist. And in the case of Petarabo, there is an easily identifiable commonality found in all of this which allows us to identify the individual that always stood in the Primarch's way and kept Petarabo from his self-professed love of architecture, of philosophy, and of peace. Namely, of course, Petarabo. <laughs> you think I jest, but I don't. At the end of the day, Petarabo was always the one that prevented himself from pausing on a conquered world to do what he told the Emperor that he would do atop the Tower Astartes. Leave them better than we found them. Petarabo's workshop on Olympia was filled with plans, with ideas for programs and for buildings that would have vastly improved the quality of life for everyone on Olympia. Yet, for virtually the entirety of his stay at Damakos' court in the city-state of Lokos, he implemented nearly a single one of them. When he eventually left Lokos to begin his conquest of Olympia, he did not come to conquer with the chisel or the drawing board. He came with tanks, artillery, and phalanxes of men to crush everyone who stood before him. And when the Emperor came to Olympia and raised Petarabo up into the stars and gave him a legion to command and near infinite authority to do with them what he wished, he did not stop on the worlds he conquered, he did not rebuild them, he did not build a grand empire like Gilliman, or a marvellous city like Tizga, or even simply just the general betterment of society that Horace Lupercal championed. The traitor at Rabo had every opportunity to do all of this and more, but never did. So clearly the key lies in making him into a Primarch that did do all of these things. And to do that, we need to go back to Olympia. We need to go back long before the Lord of Iron's raising of that planet. We need to go back to before he arrived at Damakos's court. We need to go back to before Petarabo's earliest memory of him clinging to a rain-slick cliffside with the last of his strength ebbing out of his arms. Because the Petarabo that first bent apart the metal of his gestation pod to breathe his first breath of Olympian air was a 
very different person to the one who ordered a tenth of his own legion murdered. This young Petrabo, though he still possesses many of the traits and qualities of his traitorous counterpart, was inquisitive, energetic even, and a little mischievous. Not really a word you'd think would apply to the Lord of Iron, but considering his primary interaction with the local Olympian populace was stealing their sheep. You can kind of see where I'm coming from with that. Though, obviously, Petrabo didn't steal the little fluffies merely just to be a douchebag. Even a Primarch has to eat, after all, and sheep provide easy access to meat and hides with which to clothe his rapidly growing form. He also began shaping their little bones into needles, their sinew turned into thread, and the little bits and pieces that were left over were used to fasten his roughly shaped clothing onto his body. And this is where I must once more urge you to go watch the full length lore video, because there is a lot to talk about in Petrabo's early history here, and I'll endeavour to hit at least the highlights to give you a good idea of what's going on and what's happening, but I mean I could talk about this for 20 minutes to put it into a little bit of perspective. Anywho, Petrabo was, as mentioned, bothering the local fluffy population, and the sheep herders who owned the sheeps were not overjoyed by this. As far as they were concerned, he was some brigand, thief, wild child, gods only knew who he was or what he was doing out here, and frankly these sheep herders probably didn't care over much. All they cared about was the fact that he was eating their charges. And so obviously whenever Petraba would make off with a fluffy or make the attempt to get one, they would try to chase him off with their staves, their pitchforks and their slings. Yet despite being outwardly and obviously hostile to Petraba, Petraba never not once displayed any sort of aggression or hostility towards them. And be absolutely certain, though Petraba was still just a boy at this point in time, he would have no problems whatsoever snapping each and every one of their little nekus like dry firewood. Hell, Korax's first action upon arriving on his world was to slaughter a bunch of fully armed grown men. Conrad's first interaction with humanity was dinner. Petrabo could have killed them like nothing. And he probably knew that he could as well, but he didn't. Now he always felt a certain connection with these sheep herders. He recognized humanity as something that was akin to or similar to him, but he also never felt an urge to really reach out or join them or integrate in their society or anything like that. He was perfectly happy existing here on the fringes and occasionally sneaking a few peeks and a little bit of observation time at local villages. Anywho, one day when he was being chased, a massive monstrous serpent creature decided that it wanted a snack as well, and decided that one of the sheep herder's children was just about the right size for this. The rest of the sheep herders were utterly powerless to stop the monster as it slowly devoured the child, and Petrabo, having made his way up onto a cliff nearby, was looking down at the creature and thinking to himself, whether or not he should intervene. The sheep herders were attacking the monster, but they were having absolutely no effect, and they were shouting something up at Petrabo, who couldn't understand their language, but <laughs> their child is being eaten by a monster snake. The gist of the conversation was fairly obvious. But Petrabo had no real relationship with these people, a uh, purely antagonistic one, that is. They, after all, decided to chase him across the meadow every time he went out for dinner. So what reason did he have to get involved in this? Particularly to fight a giant monster snake with his bare hands. His massively effective brain calculated the odds in milliseconds and found them to not really be to his liking. And yet, the young Petrabo sat there perched on this cliff for 60 whole seconds 
as he, and this is the only conceivable explanation I can come up for a Primarch, one of the most intelligent creatures in the galaxy, needing a full minute to come to a decision, namely that Petravo was desperately racking his brain for an excuse to intervene. Any reason, no matter how small, though at the very least with a hint of persuasion to it, to intervene and try and save this child. But eventually, as the story goes, of course, he was unable to find a persuasive reason, and so he simply just turned around and left. And this is where, if I was lazy, I'd simply just say that, no, no, he decided to actually help this time around. He killed the giant snake because, I mean, Lionel Johnson choked out a Calibanite lion, a creature literally impervious to bot rounds, with his bare hands. I am sure Petrabo could have made some very appealing sushi of this snake thing. And then, of course, rejoicing at their saviour's intervention, the people would take him in, give him a family, give him friends and warmth and a community and all of that. But here's the thing. That would fundamentally go against Petarabo's character, because he was already a very cold and a very calculating individual. And there is no warp influence to excuse this. There is no storms of knowledge to excuse this. This is simply who Petorabo is. And breaking that... <sighs> the point is to make a loyalist Lord of Iron, not a separate character entirely. So Petorabo turns and walks away. But famously, he then shows up at another small village nearby where he barges into a blacksmith and forges himself a sword with the assistance of the local blacksmith who's looking upon this child working metal like nothing he has ever seen and just kind of deciding to go along with it. Olympia was an extraordinarily superstitious society who saw... Well, whom, the entire society that is, they saw the intervention of their gods in everything. Oh, it's raining? That must be the gods. Oh, the sun's up in the morning? That must be the gods. Oh, this ginormous child thing works metal. That's obviously the gods' intervention. And so on. Having forged his sword, Petrabo then went off to kill the serpent. He then delivered the serpent's body to the father of the child that had been eaten, who was probably deeply confused by all of this. Again, Olympia is an extraordinarily superstitious society, and also a very harsh one. There is a fantastic quote that illustrates this perfectly, from one of the tyrants of Olympia, Adolphus. He says, The day a man of Olympia loses his paranoia, is the day he loses his life. That is exactly how Olympian society functions. Everyone is out for themselves because life is that goddamn hard. And so when this man sees this weird, monstrous boy who just murdered a snake that a dozen sheep herders couldn't even bother, I mean, he's just looking at him like, okay, that's that's pretty insane. What the hell are you? Uh, you're a bit late to save my boy, but I guess you're some kind of deity, a hero, a blessing, a curse. I don't bloody know. Um, and so he decides to try and make use of Petrabo by informing him that there is a hydra nesting in a nearby valley. Again, it seems unfathomably cruel to meet the person who, at the very least, got revenge for your son and then went, Yes, yes, that's cool and all, but go kill the Hydra now, please. But again, I must stress that as far as this poor sheep herder was concerned, again, a sheep herder in an incredibly superstitious society, all he could probably see in front of him was some kind of divine intervention. And after Petrabo did, of course, kill the Hydra as well, a considerably tougher fight than the snake, that is more or less what 
Petarabo became to the local populace. He became some kind of godlike entity, or not god specifically, a, a hero, uh, a hero of myth or legend that wandered from village to village slaying monsters and producing items of incredible artifice. As the locals started laying out offerings to him, uh, clothing, sewing kits, foods, utensils, cooking pots, and so on and so on. And having seen these things now for the first time, Petarabo was able to look at them and go, oh, Ah, I see. This is a hammer. This is a chisel. I'm supposed to make fire with this. Ooh, <laughs> cooked meat. Better than raw, Fluffy, absolutely. And along with his travels, his fame, his myth, his legend grew alongside his increasingly incredible exploit. As he killed monsters and presumably produced all kinds of interesting things, uh, clothings, weapons, plowshares possibly, we don't know exactly how closely he worked with the various societies at this point in time, but since we know that he was known for his artifice, it seems reasonable to suggest that he may have done some sort of trade, perhaps, with the locals, along the lines of, here, you have this awesome ass hammer, and you give me a fluffy, that way you don't have to chase me when I get hungry again. And as for the reason why Petoraba was doing all of this, because that of course is a very important part of all of this, it seems to be because of his connection to these people. No matter how tenuous and vague it was, and I am sure that he was rationalizing it to himself even as he was doing it. Again, he spent a whole minute trying to find some reason to intervene and save the child. It doesn't seem like much of a stretch at all to suggest that Petr Arbo realized that, okay, I kill monster, Locals happy. Locals give me stuff. Ergo, I have a reason to kill monsters because the locals give me stuff. And this, I believe, was his rationalization of what he was doing. Oh, he wasn't doing this just to help people. No, no, no. He, he likes utensils and free sheepskin rags and food and stuff. That's totally the reason. Not simply just that killing all of these monsters massively help out the local villagers. And so now that we know these things, we can begin to construct a little bit of a vision of what Petarabo was like back then. He was clearly doing this to help out the local communities. The handful of trinkets they were giving him were not worth risking his life again and again fighting bloody monsters. Nor was Petarabo the kind of Primarch to just take innate pleasure in the hunt either. Previous to this, the most vicious thing he'd ever hunted was a fluffy, after all. And he also never showed any hostility to the humans. He clearly valued them, though not in a direct sense. He wasn't particularly interested, it seems, in taking part in their society, or to be a accepted or to join them in any real way, as the closest he ever seemingly came to them was when he delivered the trophy, the kill, to the slain child's father. Now, it's possible that he was suppressing his need to interact with humanity, but I don't actually think so, because when he wandered straight into that forge and simply started smithing away, he didn't care. All right, there's an old smith over there. He just looks at him like, huh, you gonna help me? Come on, I'm making a sword over here. And then he simply just walked on out again, never to be seen in that village again. This paints the picture of a very reclusive, but obviously good Petrabo. And then comes the storms of knowledge. And this is where we need to answer a little bit of a deus ex machina with another Deus Ex Machina. As the Petarabo, who made it to the top of that cliff to be greeted by Damakos' soldiers, was a very different Petarabo from the one who spent all of his time crafting little trinkets in the woods and helping local villagers. Now you might be asking, what is a storm of knowledge? Well, that's the Deus Ex Machina. Apparently, 
Petarabo experienced on at least two occasions a storm of knowledge where something he did unlocked a dam in his mind and information simply flooded out in an uncontrollable torrent wiping out all of his memories and experiences up until that point replacing it with pure knowledge now this obviously has some rather strident problems uh, first and foremost that all primarchs have perfect memory absolute recall they remember every last single little thing they have ever said or done plus all of the knowledge already worked into their minds by the emperor yet none of the other primarchs experience this even with all of the additional weight of memories their cavernous minds never filled to that point now, it's entirely possible that this may have been some kind of flaw in Petrabo, some error in his production line that caused the dam to not only break in the first place, but to overwrite his previous memories through nonsense, nonsense, insert plot here reasons. But I prefer the second interpretation, which is that the gods of chaos did something to him whilst his distation pod was traveling through the warp. We know the gods have the ability to interfere with the Primarchs whilst they're in their pods. We know this via Sanguinius and Magnus. And seeing as one of the things that Petarabo suddenly started seeing in the sky was the Eye of Terror, the Star of Maelstrom as he called it, it seems to not be too much of a stretch to say that they probably had a hand in his condition. But why would they do this? What, what point does this serve? What reason would they have for this? Well, I believe there to be two. When Petrabo had his second storm of knowledge and found himself halfway up the cliff, climbing up to the city-state of Locos, his first memory was that of betrayal and hurt, wondering to himself who the hell could have abandoned a child on a cliff in the rain. His very first memory then is a negative one. And furthermore, the star maelstrom that he could now see in the sky, as there is no mention of him being able to see it previously, suggesting that it was a result of the mental overload, and certainly the ability to constantly see literally hell in your mind, that could cause all kinds of interesting side effects and no doubt about it. And Petrabo described the Maelstrom as a constant oppressing force on his life. Something baleful, glowering and evil always staring down at him. He even attributes his often miserable personality to its continued presence in his life. And I can certainly see why. And on top of that... There is also the fact that this apparently, these memory wipes, robbed him of the joy of discovery. Petrabo once explained that whereas his other brothers got to find things out, discover things and realize things, he simply just knew everything from the start. Which is interesting, because all of the Primarchs have always had a lot of information in their minds. Um, I brought up this example in the lore video as well, with Korax instantly being able to determine that the air was cold because of the atomic structure of the air around him. They have the knowledge, it's just not quite understood or grasped, fathomed. Whereas Petarabo insists that he always knew everything there was to know immediately and automatically. Whereas in reality, that wasn't the case at all. The Petarabo that was bothering Fluffies in the meadows, he didn't even know how to make pants. His clothing was simply just rags of sheepskin that he'd loosely stitched together with sinew. <laughs> A ridiculously far cry from the artifice that he would eventually create when he saw actual clothing and thought to himself, Oh, stitches go here, I see. Petrabo had, 
had that experience, that that rush of discovery, that pleasure of figuring things out, but the storms of knowledge robbed him of these things. And that, I believe, was the plan. A constant, dour, gloomy star formation in the sky, being unable to take enjoyment in what he liked to do the most, building and creating, and also this emptiness in his soul, as if all of the things worth experiencing were simply just locked away from him, something that he could just never connect with. Small surprise that he turned into a bit of a douchebag, so if we want a loyalist Petarabo, this is the thing we need to change. And I don't feel too bad about countering one Deus Ex Machina with another. And so, loyalist Petravo, when he arrived at Damakos's court and created the perfect sword, and Damakos then asked him to serve under him in return for access to all of Locos's libraries and all of its wise men, Petarabo would have had an absolute field day. Every bit of information he could scrounge up would be something new and wondrous, something interesting, something entertaining, something glorious. He would learn to build with wood, with stone, with brick and mortar, and when he used all of that, he'd invent new ways to build, with new materials, new structures, new designs, and new ways of creating ever more elaborate works of architecture. We even know that the traitor, Petrabo, had an entire tower that Damakos had simply given over to his own use, filled to the brim with marvellous drawings, revolutionary ideas and programs that would have massively improved the lives of everyone on Olympia, but traitor Petarabo never built it because he felt like it would be rejected. He didn't feel appreciated, and again, I don't necessarily think that was the reason either, because Damakos tried to shower him with compliments. When he saw one of his drawings, he was like, this is amazing, this is an incredible bathhouse, we must show this to the elders immediately. Traitor Petarabo scoffed at that and insulted his father. He insulted the elders and simply just tried to shoo his father away. Loyalist Petarabo, which would have been able to take part in all of the enjoyment and pleasures of learning things, would be overjoyed to get to build a new thing. What did he care about the elders, ancient priests and wise men that he knew and could demonstrate time and time again that he knew better than? In fact, at that point, much later in Petarabo's life, would the elders even have continued to be in existence in Olympia? With Petarabo going full ham, building fantastic temples, bathhouses, theatres, revolutionising plumbing, the medical system, all of it, who wouldn't look to him for almost everything instead? And sure, absolutely, Damakos would use Petarabo. Damakos would ask him to create weapons, he would ask him to fortify the walls, he would ask him to impress dignitaries and be used in diplomatic ploys, sure. But that is simply the way of things on Olympia. And Petarabo, flush with the enjoyment of actually creating things, I don't think he would have been as sore about it as the traitorous version. And bearing in mind as well, and I stress this heavily in the lore video because it is so important. Petarabo's adoptive family, his father at the very least, did not reject him. Damakos did not use Petarabo merely as a tool, a thing he kept locked up in a tower somewhere to be brought out for foreign dignitaries to gawp at. No, no, no. We see a scene from Damakos's point of view where he tries, he genuinely tries to connect with Petarabo, which he calls his son. Olympia is a harsh society, and being a ruler of an Olympian city-state, you have to be a hard man. And Damakos was, no doubt about it. But he did try, and Petarabo was the one who rejected him. Petarabo was the one who constantly nursed every grudge, as Damakos said. There, there, 
one part of the scene was so excellent. Damako sees all of his drawings, he sees Petrabo hard at work in a new one, and he says, joking, a little, a small barb and friends and family, hard at work out your follies, son? Again, that, that's an entirely normal comment to a, a friend, a family member. Like, the, these are your follies. I call them that because I am a hard man. I am Damakos the Tyrant. You know, I am the one who protects the city, and so I view these other things as a little bit silly. An in-joke, which he also demonstrates by seconds later picking up the drawing of a bathhouse and going, This is amazing, son. And what does Petarabo do? He just scoffs. He just scoffs at him. He mocks him, and Damakos immediately regrets it, because he then fires back a barb of his own, and he can see in Petarabo's eyes that he picks up on that insult instantly, almost hungrily, and Damakos knows that he's going to be nursing that insult for weeks and months. Petarabo was... <laughs> was desperate, almost, to be insulted. He, he perversely enjoyed it, in a fashion, I believe, as he would seek out every instance of ridicule and try and construe it in some negative fashion. A lovely example is that he was apparently... If people laughed and Petrabo hadn't meant to be funny, oh, that was, that was the worst thing. Like, that was a true insult, again, that he would sit there and nurse on in his tower for weeks and months. And all of that undoubtedly piles up in a man's mind. Though, again, this was of his own doing. At the end of uh, Petarabo's loyalist career, when he had returned to Olympia to scorch it to the ground, he finally met his sister the only person in the family that he genuinely cared for himself as well, and realized that she was the one who had betrayed him. She was the one who had turned Olympia against him, and she was the one who now berated him, who yelled at him, Oh, poor Petarabo, poor injured, wounded Petarabo, never loved, never appreciated. Here you are, burning a world to the ground because of your grudges. You are pathetic and you are petulant, Califon says to him. And God is she spot on. Because the traitor Petarabo, if you were to describe him in one word, absolute petulance, is that word. On the other hand, the loyalist, Petrabo, would in the early days in Olympia be acting far more like the traitor did on Terra. Because I'm not pulling this entirely out of my ass, I'm not simply saying, oh, Petrabo would totally have loved this. No, we know that he would have. Because when he was taken to Terra by the Emperor, he met Magnus the Red. <sighs> Two more unlikely friends one wouldn't think could ever exist, really, but they bonded over their shared love of knowledge, an absolute pursuit of it. And on Terra, Petarabo was happier than he was ever before. He was actually content for a short, brief, blissful period of time as he delved into the countless ruins scattered all over Old Earth and discovered his beloved Firenze Polymath, the visionary genius whom Petarabo, uh, well, he, he gave him the highest of pranks. He imitated him, a Primarch imitating the works of a mere mortal human. Petrabo's cavia ferum was created as a direct evolution of the Ferenzi polymath's vast drawings of the perfect labyrinth, and Petrabo even created a perpetual motion engine, which he put in a Warhound Titan, which is the biggest fucking waste of a perpetual motion engine <laughs> literally imaginable, but hey, details. In fact, Petarabo was so happy on Terra that he even cracked a joke. 
Fetterabo cracked a joke. It, it, and, he, and he even accepted a quip at his expense. Atop the Astartes Tower, when he talked to the Emperor before taking his vows of allegiance and getting to be in charge of his legion to venture out into the Crusade, the Emperor talked to him about an unjust war, and how this was something that Petravo absolutely had to avoid. The Emperor already, I believe, had some suspicions about Petravo's eventual fate and tried to steer him onto a more beneficent path, tried to urge him to, to build a bit more, to construct, to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, a point that went whee, right over Petarabo's head, but at that point in time, Petarabo said, we must leave them better than we found them, in response to the Emperor's talk about the, the need to avoid an unjust war. And the Emperor pointed out that, oh, you, you stole that from your beloved Firenze Polymath, didn't you? And Petarabo smiles and says, I had hoped to pass that off as my own wisdom. It might not be much, but that's, a, that's as close to a happy Petrabo as you're going to be getting. And so, I think it's reasonable to assume that if Petrabo was able to experience all of that joy of discovery, of, of research and learning on Olympia, with the full benefit of his, of his memories and the full benefit of the, his emotional registry open to him, I think that that could have been him and Damakos talking. He also had a brother, Andos, who was apparently a brilliant mind and would have been one of the most exceptional individuals of his age were it not for Petrabo. Um, Oft repeated commonality with the Primarchs, isn't it? And the traitor Petarabo seemed to love putting Andos's down. He would constantly challenge him to various things. Oh, let's, um, let's do a running contest, let's do a building contest, let's forge weapons, and Petarabo would always win. Always. And that is not a fun thing, isn't it? Being the butt of somebody else's self-aggrandizement can't be super fun particularly not in the long term, and particularly not from your own father's adopted super son. Yeah. Andos eventually retreated uh, back into his own hobbies and had another altercation with Petarabo, but go watch the proper lore video for that one, as it would be a little bit too much of a divergence here. The loyalist Petarabo might, instead of challenging Andor's two things, might simply enjoy discovering things alongside him, like he did with Magnus. He would have a brother, a friend, a fellow aficionado, someone interested in the same things as him, and someone at least kind of capable of matching up to his own brilliance as well. Uh, whether or not their relationship would have been able to remain good is difficult to say, bearing in mind Olympia's rather harsh succession nature, but at the very least it would have been an early comrade for Petarabo, and traitor Petarabo didn't have really many friends. His closest was Magnus, and he he could have asked Magnus about the star Maelstrom, but Petrabo wouldn't, because he had asked Ferris Manus, and Ferris Manus had simply looked at him as if he didn't understand what he was asking at all, and that made Petrabo clam up right away and feel like he had betrayed a weakness to Ferris, and he'd never do that to someone he considered a friend. That would make him far, far too vulnerable. But he did work together with Vulcan on the miniature perpetual motion engine, for example, which required unfathomably intricate gear working to get to actually work. So it's not impossible that he would have been able to get along with Andos, and now that he had the experience of a friend, maybe he could have been able to 
create an actual genuine bond between himself and somebody like Vulcan. I think Vulcan would have been more than open to a comrade in Petar Harbor. Ferris Manus, well, the Gorgon will always be the Gorgon, I do suppose. But a Vulcan Petar Harbor combo? Now that would be quite something. Though, I suppose, if we're gonna start talking about traitor Vulcans at some point. Maybe that wouldn't have been the grandest idea either. Mm, traitor Vulcan. Now, there's going to be an even more difficult one than Loyalist Petarabo, isn't it? How do you turn the only good guy in 40k into the villain? Good question. But also one for another day. Now then, having... Uh, brought Petarabo up as a little bit more of a good boy, less of a whiny monster man-child. What about the Emperor? Because eventually Big E will be arriving on Olympia, and what will he find when he arrives? Because traitor Petarabo had just about finished taking over the entire planet after an assassination attempt on him had involved his sister. Big mistake. Very big mistake, as it caused Petravo to start bombing cities into the ground. The loyalist version of Petravo, I think, would probably be in much the same point of control over Olympia, but in a very different way. The various city-states of the planet were extraordinarily independent and functioned as their own little mini-nations. But the foremost amongst all of them, the one with the best infrastructure, the best healthcare, the best theatres, the best everything, and the home to the gift of the gods, Petarabo, would undoubtedly have had an incredibly prominent position due to Petarabo's constant innovations, and if the other city-states decided to band together to try and prevent the meteoric rise of Locos, well, then Petarabo would just have another reason to show off his tanks. And speaking of armoured might, let's talk a bit about how this Petarabo might treat his legion, shall we? Because one of the first weapons that Petaravo started making on Olympia were tanks. Massive, smoke-belching, monstrous tanks. Almost as much to simply demonstrate to the enemy that, hey, look, I can make these. <laughs> you can't kill them. As to use them for their effectiveness. Assuming nothing weird happens on Terra, Petarabo would probably befriend Magnus as normal. He'd probably get a lot closer to Vulcan and possibly even Ferris Manus as well. I doubt he'd ever get along with Dorn or Gilliman or many of the others, but at least he might have some comrades, some actual brothers amongst the Primarchs. But when it comes to the Fourth Legion Astartes, Traitor Petrabo's first action was to decimate the Legion. The ancient Roman punishment, where the entire military force would draw lots, and one in ten would draw a lot with a particular mark on it, singling him out for death. And a very special kind of death as well as the man would then be beaten to death by his nine other comrades. It was an extreme punishment all the way back during the time of the Roman legions, and he was considered absolutely barbaric now. Many of the other Primarchs even lobbied for the Emperor to remove Petaravo from command, chastise him at the very least, as he had clearly proven that he was not worthy of commanding Astartes in battle. But the Emperor had Petaravo's back because he presumably wanted to give him a little bit of leeway. This was his legion, after all. But the worst part of it all, of course, was that this was not a punishment for a defeat or some gross neglect or failure. This was the punishment the Iron Warriors received for a victory 
bought at too high a cost. Now granted, the butcher's bill was dear indeed, with a full third of the legion killed, along with two million imperial army personnel, but even so, it was an extraordinary punishment, and I do not believe that loyalist Peterabo would have embraced that for one second, because you need a certain... not even coldness, you need an absolute disregard for life to do such a thing, particularly to a legion already hammered by casualties. And Petrabo had already demonstrated this on Olympia, where he had ordered his men to simply assault in massive wave tactics to demonstrate to the enemy that they had no hope of stopping him. That, again, it's, it's not merely cold, calculating decision-making. It is not merely war as a mathematical equation. You have to be able to look at your soldiers and view them as absolutely nothing but numbers to embrace such a method of warfare. And that is what the traitor Petarabo had done. I very much so doubt the loyalist version who would have built walls alongside these men, trained alongside these men, built fighting vehicles for them, built weapons for them, built armor for them, would have been able to do the same, since the loyalist version would actually have been able to build some relationships with the people around him, hopefully at the very least with Damakos, his sister, and Andos, his brother. Nevertheless, I don't think that he would have let them go without some form of punishment. Petarabo would still have been cold, detached, aloof, and he certainly would not have been overly fond of demonstrating his attachment. I don't think he would have been a, a touchy-feely Primarch, shall we say. Oh no, 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 not at all. A punishment would undoubtedly have been in order, but I think it would have been more along the lines of humiliation, probably. Perhaps he would have carried out decimation, but for every tenth man he would take them aside, order them to lay down on the ground in the massive hangar of the ship where he carried it out, and then just walk over them. Maybe wearing his armor if he was feeling particularly churlish. But the point that would be made would I again leave more one of humiliation and demonstration. Is this all you are? Has my father given me command of a legion of fodder? Of corpses? Of fools too stupid to know when to retreat, too stupid to realize when a different approach is needed, too unflexible to bend. Because if so, I have no use for a legion that will be spent in another three battles. My father has tasked me to conquer the galaxy not bleed myself dry on backwater compliances. I'd also like to think perhaps there might be introduced some sort of mark of censure. Something along the lines of the Ultramarines' red helmets, perhaps. Something brightly coloured. The Legionnaire was forced to carry with them at all time. Hmm, what clashes nice and well with burnished iron? Uh, a bright azure blue chest plate, for example, to really make him stand out. This man is guilty of callousness. This man is a danger to you, to the Legion, and to our purpose. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. I really like that. That would also create a certain bond within the Iron Warriors, because this is another thing as well. The Legion had taken on an aspect of their Primarch, possibly even before the arrival of Petrabo, where it was not one of brotherhood. The Iron Warriors were 
not a legion at odds with itself necessarily, like the word bearers or the emperor's children would become, but also not one of common purpose. They didn't really value one another, and they certainly valued themselves, their own goals, ambitions, far, far, far more. One did not become a warsmith in the traitor Petrabo's legion by giving two tossers about one's subordinates. This would also need to change. The Iron Warrior's entire mode of warfare would need to change. They could still be siege expert, but perhaps lengthy siege experts, and the Iron Warriors have the elements of this as well, the careful escalade, the correct application of firepower to blast the largest breach in the enemy's most vulnerable sections so as to grant the maximum advantage to the attacker. Uh, couple this with rapid moving encirclement tactics, armoured spearheads trying to cut the enemy off from their fortifications before they could even be occupied, or large-scale aerial operations, bombing campaigns, or more complex uses of gas warfare, etc, etc. There are a myriad ways in which Petrabo could continue his dour, direct, and calculating way of warfare without having to simply pelt his men at imaginary walls, as Gilliman put it. And I really did like that quote as well. Paraphrasing, but Gilliman apparently said something along the lines of, if our enemies so much as thought of a wall, Petorabo would pelt it with our legionnaires until it crumbled. There are many other ways to take a fortress than mass human wave escalades, and many of them just as mathematical, undermining the walls, creating an underground war in which the Astartes would absolutely excel, close, dirty, brutal fighting where strength of arm, quickness of reflexes, and power of armor would have been absolutely paramount. Perhaps Petrabo could have invented burrowing tanks or massed aerial insertion doctrines. Ooh, wouldn't that have been really awesome? If the Iron Warriors created huge landing dropships designed to deploy troops via grav lifts behind enemy lines. Perhaps even doing a full-on World War II German invasion of the Netherlands thing, dropping assault marines on top of enemy fortifications before they can be fully manned, and seizing them from the inside out. Petrabo could be a brilliant military tactician if he actually just gave two shits about the lives of his men, instead of simply taking the easy way out and saying, all right, I think I'm going to need to use 10,000 men to take this wall. Maybe he challenges himself and thinks, I can do it with five or a thousand if he's feeling uh, gutsy. This would also yet further help Petrabo with his uh, people person problems. Traitor Petrabo did not appreciate his trident, his closest advisors, his warsmith's council. A kind of mini mournful in a way. But Petrabo had on multiple occasions thought about simply just disbanding them outright. He didn't care for their advice, he didn't care about their perspective, and he certainly didn't give two shits about their military insight. What were they going to teach him that he didn't already know? He, Petarabo, the Emperor's greatest strategist, alchemist, builder, blah 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 blah, with the Cavia Ferrum stuffed full of wonders that never saw the light of day. Hmm? Loyalist Petrabo would probably also have a trident, but he would put people in it that he respected. He would build a certain fraternity amongst them. Maybe they could have been the actual mournival for Petrabo, a collection of officers designed to mellow out Petrabo's humours. Where he might be tempted to approach things a little too coldly, a little bit too mathematically, perhaps the trident could 
gently push him away from it, suggest alternative solutions to problems, and perhaps even be like, oh, I, f I forget his name, but Ferus Manus, aid and adjutant, the man who could stare into the Gorgon's wrath and basically tell him to chill out a whole bit and calm him down, keeping him from outright murdering the rest of his warriors. Something Manus was uh, tempted to do on more than one occasion. And if the Gorgon could be tamed, surely Petarabo could be as well, right? At least I like to believe so. Now let's wrap it up, shall we? Let us get to the end of the Loyalist Lord of Iron. The key here is the Storms of Knowledge. I fundamentally believe that because deprived of the ability to enjoy the things he was doing, there was really no actual reason for Petrabo to truly dedicate himself to his craft. There was no real point because he was always looking to the horizon, always looking to tomorrow. Oh no, no, I'll build after this compliance action is over. No, no, no. I'll build after this war is over. No, 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 I'll build after this crusade is over and so on and so on. He had no one to balance his more melancholic humors and he had no way to take joy in life which might allow him to build the bonds he needed to again, balance out his more volatile nature, and also to contribute a little bit of warmth to Petarabo. He absolutely had the capacity for it, but part of it was beaten out of him by the star Maelstrom, and the rest of it was taken care of by his inability to enjoy anything. Even though, again, as Terra demonstrated, he could do that as well. With all that being said, I have been Arch. Please let me know what you think about the video down in the comments section below, and the custom art used in the background, probably one of the last custom art pieces GW you're going to be seeing out of me for a very long time at the very least, is available on Subscribestar and Patreon. Until next time, have a good day.